Good morning, everybody. Um, this has actually been kind of a welcome relief. Uh, being in a hotel for the last few days, as B said, I have a, a new son, so I'm actually getting some sleep here, which has been nice. Um, so as, as B said, I'm going to be talking about um, general st stream stability. Um, and I'm, I'm talking kind of high level on this. Obviously, it's a very complicated subject. And um, while I'm not going to be talking about any new equations or new um, analysis tools, uh, like some of our later presenters, hopefully this will provide a little bit of a foundation for um, some of the discussions that you're going to see um, moving forward. So the way that I'm going to do this is um, I'm going to start off and talk about the importance of channel stability. Uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, everybody believes that. Uh, I'll talk a little about some of the general analysis methods. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the considerations um, that we make for these types of analyses. And then really the majority of what I'm going to try to talk about is use some examples of work that I've been involved with um, and, and use that as kind of approaches and some general assumptions and, and uh, considerations that you should be making when uh, going through a, a stream stability analysis. Um, and I included this quote on here because um, I don't know, a lot of uh, sediment transport guys I think have seen this before, but it always makes us feel good about ourselves. Um, so I, I think everybody's probably seen a lot of statistics up to this point about um, stream stability and scour and, and erosion and the importance of, uh, of the practice. Uh, I have seen actually very uh, differing statistics in, in, uh, in the number of bridge failures a year and the number of, of, uh, of bridges that are, are fail from, from scour and erosion. Um, however, I, I did throw up a, a table of um, bridges here uh, from New York, and you can see that in their data set that basically I think 20% failed from scour and another 30% from flood. Um, Utah State did a study, and uh, I think they, s they said that one in 4,700 bridges will fail annually out of five or 600,000 over, over water. So again, this is a, a significant issue and something that, that needs to be considered. Um, and I, I think everybody probably saw this same slide uh, yesterday morning from Matt Johnson when he was talking about uh, culvert analysis. But um, I, I really think that um, you know the overall process of sediment transport and particle motion is, is relatively simple. It's a free, you know, free, free body diagram that everybody's seen in, in our undergraduate days. Um, and really, it's, it's just about the, the overall forces on particles. So in, in theory, it's pretty simple. But in practice, it's very complex. You know, we're never dealing with homogeneous um, materials. And, and hydrology is different. And hydraulics are very complicated. So again, there's, there's a lot goes into this. And I think that. Um, you know, the, the lane balance um, is, is a very good illustration of uh, really that relationship between flow and hydrology um, and sediment transport, uh, slope, stream stability. So um, again, it's just a really good tool for being able to understand sort of that relationship. And, and um, you know, we use that a lot then to kind of wrap our heads around vertical stability, horizontal stability, um, if the channel is steeper, it's going to need more sediment. Is that going to come off the banks? Is that going to come off the channel bottom? Um, again, just kind of tools to, to help us get our, uh, our head wrapped around that. So as far as channel stability guidance, um, there's a ton of, of publications out there. There's a ton of guidance documents. There's a ton of approaches. Um, and everybody has their favorites. And, and there are, are benefits and um, drawbacks to a lot of these. Um, so I, you know, I just listed up. Uh, several of these um, general uh, organizations that address stream stability, uh, there really are, um, like I said, a, you know, sheets and sheets and sheets of, of reference documents that I could have put up here. Um, one of the I did want to highlight, um, obviously, these conferences are very good um, information for, for stream stability. There's a lot of new studies that are being continually done. And um, again, I just think that, you know, obviously, coming up here and, and presenting and, and listening to you guys all present is is very beneficial in, in finding out um, new methods. So a little bit about just general uh, channel stability methods. Um, like I said, I'm going to kind of cover this at a high level. Obviously, um, we could talk for days on digging down into each of these different types of analyses. Um, but some of the typical ones are, are reference channel approaches. Uh, so this is where we have like a reference reach. Um, I think you know Rosgen is, is very synonymous with this. And, and sort of a simplistic view of this would be to 
um, find a channel that's stable and then try to emulate that in your channel um, in, a, in a stable condition. Um, and, and obviously that's kind of a simplistic view of that, but that's the general approach. Uh, historic channel behavior. Uh, so we, we try to really do this on any uh, stream stability analysis. And that's really reviewing historic data, um, trying to find what the past trends were, and then use that to, to help drive our, our analyses moving forward. Uh, there's channel threshold methods. I think there's probably been a couple of those discussed in this um, conference already. Um, critical shear stress, um, critical velocities, when you have basically incipient motion of particles. Um, so this, this bottom figure here is from um, NRCS, uh, critical velocity plot. So it's just kind of an example of that. Um, the, there's also empirical channel form equations. Uh, I listed Dr. Julian up there because um, got to study with him at CSU and he's who I'm familiar with, but um, he has a set of equations that basically define um, channel width or channel meander, uh, meander uh, length based off of um, discharge or watershed size, things like that. So then we get into a little bit more of the, uh, the hydraulic analysis and, and sort of more detailed um, numerical approaches. Uh, so there's a sediment budget analysis approach, and basically we, you would break your, your stream reach down into, or your project reach down into various segments, um, and you account for annual or compute annual sediment uh, yield for each of those, or load for each of those reaches, and sort of do this accounting practice uh, through, the, through the reaches um, to see how much sediment's moving and where it's going to deposit and where it's not, where it's going to um, uh, be eroded from. Uh, and so then the next, the next sort of step in, or evolution in that is a full-blown sediment transport model. Um, that's when you would have uh, basically a hydraulic model, and then that model would adjust based off of the erosion, um, the sediment transport capacity, and change the channel geometry, uh, and then go to the next time step. And so it's, it's a more dynamic solution than the sediment budget analysis. Um, and then I, I think we'll have a couple presentations later on uh, CFD models. Uh, so these are, are a lot more uh, complex. They, they account for the three-dimensional flow patterns in um, hydraulic systems. Uh, so I just listed flow 3D and, and fluent in there. Um, this is a flow 3D uh, illustration of some scour around uh, bridge piers. And again, just uh, a lot better resolution, um, a lot higher detail. And then for the really complicated um, sediment transport stream stability um, processes, uh, Physical models are still a, a, a kind of a second to none uh, tool. Uh, and I think everybody's probably familiar with flumes and, and how some of that works. So when we go through the process of deciding how we're going to analyze uh, uh, stream stability and sediment transport on a project, um, a lot of times I think we sort of default to the, the more complicated. Well, let's do a full-blown sediment transport model. Um, let's, get this, you know, let's get this answer really honed down on, on a model. Um, and, and a lot of times that's not, not always the, uh, the right approach. You don't have, have the right data. You don't have the, um, um, the information needed to do that. So I'm going to walk through uh, some examples and kind of uh, try to identify some of the considerations for this. Uh, for really understanding um, the considerations that we make when deciding what, what approach to take, uh, I think that everybody here probably would understand that the, the purpose of the study is probably the first thing you should be asking yourself. Um, what are we trying to do? Uh, what level of detail do we need? So um, I, I've just listed up here some, some of the various studies that um, um, people typically run into. Uh, there's you know, feasibility studies, fe feasibility level studies. Um, so a lot of times those are for uh, you know, looking at different alternatives for, for flood mitigation or for channel st stability or for, um, you know, transportation projects. Uh, these are typically the coarser level of detail. Um, they're a lot of times just general comparisons, and they're often fairly qualitative. Um, when you do permitting support kind of at the next level, um, again, these are a lot of times alternatives uh, evaluation, but there's a little bit more detail. Um, and again, a lot of times it's more comparative. Um, and these can be qualitative or quantitative, so you can actually be trying to determine, you know, like the depth of sediment that would deposit or the depth of erosion that would occur. Um, and then design support, obviously that's a lot more detailed. You need to understand if you're going to do a channel design or if you're going to do, you know, a specific bridge design, you need to know exactly how much 
long-term degradation you're going to have or um, how much deposition you're going to have that's filling in your channel. So I'm not going to run through all of the data needs. Uh, obviously, anybody who's done a sediment transport model or any sort of um, overall stream stability assessment understands all of the information that goes into that. Um, so again, your data can really drive what type of analysis you can do. Um, if you don't have a lot of the information that's needed for a, um, a detailed sediment transport analysis, you're going to have to do a lot of sensitivities, or you're going to have to find some, some more simplified approaches to, um, uh, to, to make those analyses or to complete those analyses. And I'll talk, talk about this in some of these examples that I'm going to um, go through. Uh, the other thing is that um, obviously time and budget are significant consider considerations, and a lot of time that's tied to these data needs. Um, so uh, certainly if, if you don't have time to complete uh, a good validation and calibration of a sediment transport model, um, you know, you, you're going have to have to think about how you want to approach that, that project. So um, now we'll jump into some of the example projects and, and kind of talk through uh, some of the considerations that, that we make. Um, I did want to point out that uh, while B introduced me as, as being with Cuban Infrastructure Engineers, um, these projects I'm going to talk about, uh, I worked on when I was at HDR Engineering, so I, I definitely want to give them credit um, where that's due. Uh, so the first project we're going to talk about is uh, Lower Santa Cruz River. Um, this was an Army Corps feasibility study, uh, study for flood reduction. Um, and really what we were doing was looking at an 80-mile reach of the Lower Santa Cruz River and trying to identify some alternatives for reducing flood impacts. Um, so the objectives of this were a qualitative understanding of channel trends uh, and a qualitative um, comparison of, of the alternatives. Uh, so we didn't really need to have a lot of detail in the sediment transport or the sediment um, analyses. We just needed to have an idea of trends. Did we expect uh, a lot of degradation to occur? Do we expect a lot of aggradation? Um, so some of the considerations when we were going through our analysis was, uh, or selecting our analysis, was um, we had limit, limited sediment data. We didn't have a lot of information on inflowing sediment loads. We didn't have a lot of information on bed sediment uh, composition. It was a very long reach. We had 80 miles that we were looking at. Um, it was a braided system, so that's a, kind of a complex hydraulic scenario. Uh, we had significant subsidence. I think they had subsidence out there in some areas of up to 15 feet over the past um, decade, uh, so or uh, 100 years. So it was uh, a, a kind of a dynamic uh, situation. Uh, we also had limited historic data, uh, so we didn't have a lot to va uh, validate or calibrate to. Um, and like I said, we're really just looking for general trends out there to just get our arms around what the, the uh, stability was. So the approach we took was we did an HTC RAS 2D model for the hydraulics, um, and that really identified where our flow patterns were, our main flow paths were. And then we did an HTC RAS one-dimensional sediment transport model after that just to identify trends. And we made a bunch, obviously we had to make some assumptions on what our inflowing sediment loads were and things like that, but that's, that's the general approach we took. Um, so what we generated were, were basically some plots like this. Um, and I, I realize that this is um, quantitative, uh, but what we were really trying to identify was just where there was uh, changes in the, in the overall bed. So where there was degradation or aggradation, where the bed was coming up or going down. Um, so again, over the, the river reach here, you can see just kind of a general idea. It gives you a good feel for uh, what's going on in the system. So the next project I'm going to talk about is uh, occluding a dam removal. Uh, this was a, a dam removal project up in Alaska, and it was on the Klutna River, uh, which is just north of um, Anchorage. And the objectives of this were uh, really the, the project is to remove this dam, and we need to understand what was going to happen to the sediment plug, all that accumulated sediment behind the dam. So the, the questions that we had were um, an understanding of the channel trends downstream, uh, the duration that the sediment would be migrating out of the sediment plug and downstream, and then how that would impact the habitats. Um, so the considerations that we had for this was there was limited sediment and historic data. We didn't know the inflowing sediment loads. Um, you're going to sense, you see kind of a common theme here a lot of times. Um, so there wasn't a lot of good gauge data. We had some limited hydrology information. Um, there was a downstream alluvial fan, so um, there's, this is all a canyon, and then it opens up into an alluvial fan. And on the alluvial fan, there was uh, several um, 
highways and, and railroads. So uh, again, this is important to understand what the, uh, the, the trends were going to be downstream. We needed to have um, a sediment under, uh, understanding of the sediment fate. So again, what was going to happen to that sediment plug and then the duration of that. So the analyses that we, we decided to go with was a threshold analysis to start and really to um, just identify if the sediment plug was going to move after we took this dam out based off of the flows that we saw in the, in the system. Um, so once we understood what sort of that sensitivity was, um, looking at a range of different sediment materials that potentially could have been in the plug, um, we decided to do an HTC RAS sediment transport model. And so again, this is the same type of model that we did previously in the last project I talk, talked about. Um, but we did an extensive sensitivity analysis because we did have a lot of uh, concern about downstream impacts, and we really wanted to get our arms around kind of the, the extremes that we may expect from the assumptions we had to make. Um, so what we produced uh, was basically a number of plots that showed uh, essentially just trends again of um, sediment deposition or um, erosion areas. And so this may be a little bit hard to see, but there's a dark line that represents the one year results from the model. So essentially one year of model runtime. And then we have a lighter green line, a lighter line that's shaded back here that's the 10 year results. Um, and so what this did was gave us essentially just kind of a feel for um, areas where there would be deposition in orange or erosion in green. Um, and so we could compare these plots next to one another for existing conditions and then um, proposed conditions and really identify because of our project where there was going to be additional um, aggradation or erosion. Um, and, and again, since we did so many sensitivity analyses, it really gave us an opportunity to get our arms around what the, um, what the various uh, assumptions impacts are. So the next project we talk about is Santa Paula Creek Flood Control Channel. This was out in California, and this was actually a design project for the Corps. Um, there was an existing uh, rip -rap line, excuse me, riprap line channel uh, that had continually filled in with sediment. And so uh, the Corps was looking at potentially raising the elevation of, um, of the channel banks and then also trying to identify some, some more specific maintenance requirements for the local, um, the local town. So the, uh, uh, the objectives of this were to identify the sediment deposition in the channel so we could understand uh, the conveyance capacity and then also support that maintenance plan. The analysis considerations that we had were that we, we did actually have uh, detailed deposition depths. We had good historic records from when they constructed the facility um, through to the present time. And so we had a lot of good information that we could validate and calibrate uh, a sediment transport model to. Um, we had limited sediment inflow data, which is pretty typical. It's um, pretty hard to find a good sediment gauge uh, to, to get a lot of good inflowing sediment information. Um, so we had to, had to make some um, validation and calibration efforts there. Um, and then it's channelized flow. So this was a trapezoidal channel. Uh, it lends itself very well to 1D uh, hydraulic models. Uh, so the approach that we ended up taking was, uh, again, using HEC RAS sediment transport model. Um, and, and really the reason that I, I show you these three projects back to back to back, um, and they're all using HEC RAS sediment transport is that um, really you can do a lot, of, use it for a lot of different purposes and how you use that um, can change depending on the information you have and um, the level of sensitivity analyses you're gonna do, if you can validate, calibrate that. So again, just these kind of assumptions you make as you go through um, deciding how you're gonna use your model and, and, and for what. Um, so, what that provided us then uh, was since we had a good validated and calibrated model, um, we were able to come up with uh, sediment deposition profiles. And uh, you can see that we had essentially the, the expected deposition that would occur. So we could run our hydraulics on top of that, see what our, um, we could see what our channel banks needed to be, our bank height needed to be. And then we also had a trigger elevation that uh, essentially if the deposition got to that level, then the local agency would have to go in and clean it out. So we were able to come up with um, good information on, on how to maintain this system. So the, the project I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, than these other three is, is the Folsom Dam Water Control Manual. This was an Army Corps project, um, and this is the Water Control Manual for 
the new gates that were constructed in Folsom Dam. Uh, and really our role was to, to look at some of the downstream impacts associated with uh, operation of these new gates. They were going to change the, the hydraulic outflows, the flows in the channel, and we needed to understand how that was going to impact the overall stream stability downstream. So the objectives of this were an understanding of horizontal stability, vertical stability, and then the overall mobility of um, gravel habitat downstream. Uh, so the challenges that we had for this were that it was a 22-mile reach, and um, there was limited bed sediment data. Uh, we had really good data, but it was kind of all over the place, and so we had to do a lot of interpolation between various areas um, and, and just make some assumptions. It was also highly variable, so there was a lot of fine sediments downstream and then a lot of bedrock upstream, so we were really dealing with um, a huge range of, of different materials. Uh, and then the other thing was that the, the Corps wanted to look at a, a very long period of operation. So they had historic data from 1930 to 2002, and we wanted, they wanted to be able to uh, have an understanding of how this channel would react with various operations for that full period of record. So we were looking at, at really a long, a long period. Um, so the analysis approach that we came up with was um, using an HEC RAS uh, hydraulic model and then using that information to do a, uh, a threshold analysis, and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, so what we did was, uh, for six, all, six different operational alternatives, um, we identified uh, the cr erosion critical sites. So we knew where erosion already was a problem, we knew where there was critical infrastructure, uh, we knew where there was critical habitat, and so we uh, identified these sites to focus on to really um, do the analysis there. Uh, so then we have our unsteady HEC RAS model that was already put together by the core uh, that had the full period of record from 1930 to 2002, so a lot of data. Um, and then what we did was we, for each of these sites, identified what the critical shear stresses were for the bed material, and then from the HEC RAS model, we identified what the shear stresses were for each of these time steps in the continuous simulation. Um, so. From that, then, we could go to this step four where we identify periods when that shear in the model was above the critical shear, identifying that there was erosion occurring. Um, so from that, then, we also would take the duration that we were above that critical shear stress, and we would identify how much erosion occurred um, based off of, of some erodibility index methods. Um, and then the final step would be to compare existing and proposed erosion, so we'd look at how much erosion occurred in existing conditions at this site, and then how much erosion uh, occurred in proposed conditions at this site. Um, and then that allowed us to really, from a, a permitting standpoint, an understanding standpoint, uh, let us know what the impacts were. So what you can see is on this top chart, um, basically we're just identifying what the changes in critical shear stress were between a proposed alternative and an existing alternative. And these are actually the tables from, uh, from that core document. Uh, that were prepared. And then on the, the bottom here, what you can see is that we identified overall changes in erosion. So um, I think the largest change in erosion was like half a foot over that 1930 to 2002 period. So at the end of this, what we could say was because of the reoperation of those gates, you know, the maximum impact that we really had at these sites of concern was about a half a, half a foot of change in erosion uh, if we had that period, same period of record that occurred. So. Again, it was just a good tool to, to, to be able to um, illustrate that. So the limitations that we had, and I already kind of touched on this, were that there was generalized bed properties. Uh, we did have to make some assumptions there. There was a huge variability in the erosion rate information. Um, so they had done some jet testing on the materials out there, and it was all over the place. So we, we definitely had to make some, some assumptions on that and, and kind of get our arms around what we thought the general trends were for the, um, for the erodibility index methods. Um, the average shear in the model was used. So again, this is, is not a super complex two-dimensional, three-dimensional model. We were just understanding um, you know, depth averaged uh, hydraulics. Uh, we had limited resolution, again, because this is such a long reach, the model had, the hydraulic model had um, you know, some, some limited detail. The benefits, though, were that we had an understanding of these huge periods of flow, so from 1930 to 2002, uh, it was repeatable um, since it was a fairly straightforward analysis. Um, you know, if you have a sediment transport model, a lot of times if 10 guys do uh, sediment transport modeling, you get come up with 10 different, 
different answers. Hopefully the trends are all the same, but they're going to probably have different magnitudes based off the assumptions they have. Um, right, easy to understand results. Um, they're easily incorporated into additional analyses. So for habitat and for um, uh, for other parts of the uh, components of the, of the project, and it was very efficient. So what are the takeaways from this, kind of to wrap it all up? Um, again, I think that uh, much can be learned from, from even these simple analyses. Um, you know, even an HEC RAS model that uses a lot of, of assumptions, I think is still uh, uh, very informative. And, and if you use it the right way, you can identify trends and, and relationships. Um, so along those lines, you don't always need the most complicated analyses. You just really need to understand your purpose. Um, oftentimes, you don't have all the information anyway. And sometimes, if you do a very complex uh, analysis, it's, it's hard to, uh, for your, your client or for the public to digest. So sometimes, a, a simpler approach is easier to understand. That said, uh, you know, I think it's very important always to do a combination of, of these types of analyses um, to validate your results and to, um, to really double check uh, your different tools. So, so don't just hone in on one. Try to, uh, you know, try to try to run a couple different different types of analyses to to make yourself believe your results, not make yourself to to confirm your results. Um, also, uh, you know, I think the, the the detailed tools that are coming out, CFD is is super exciting. Um, you know, there's there's a huge huge need for that, and and I'm not trying to discredit those types of analyses. I think that you know those are those are critical. Um, and then kind of parting thoughts, always, uh, always complete a sensitivity analysis, no matter what. Um, definitely try to understand what your, um, what your range of uh, um, results and assumptions are. Uh, and then in, in sediment transport and stream stability, you know, professional judgment is, is very important. It's very important to have somebody who has experience. It's very important to uh, ask questions from people, uh, reviewers, have it reviewed. Um, again, just professional judgment is very important in these types of analyses. Um, so with that, that was all I had uh, in the front possession uh, presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions if I have time. I don't. Uh, it was a fish passage barrier, um, so it's a, a, a very rich salmon habitat, and so they were removing. It hadn't been in use for 50 years, and so taking it out to, to reconnect parts of the, the system. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful area, beautiful area. Thank you. Thank you.